And with that, I will introduce um, Ellen and Andy. Um, Ellen is a uh, the postdoctoral and graduate program manager at the Mortgage Institute for Research and a certified global career development facilitator. And Andy is a member of our early career working group and is a core facility director at Brandeis University. Thank you, Ellen and Andy, for your presentation. And um, I'll put a link to the slides for everyone in the chat so you can follow along. Take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much, Vanessa, for the kind introduction. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to talking to people today about uh, networking and resumes. Um, so hi, I'm Andy. Uh, I am the current uh, core facility manager at Brandeis University, but just to give you a bit of a background about my career path, how I got to where I am, did my undergraduate and my PhD both at the University of York in the UK, uh, where I uh, was fortunate to, to get to experience some of the fantastic core facilities that they have at York. Uh, during my undergraduate, I was uh, also a, a P, uh, I was an intern student at AstraZeneca. Um, I uh, worked for the Academy of Medical Sciences, a charity in the UK, as part of my PhD for a, a three-month internship, working in kind of grants and programs, uh, and also mentoring. Um, and then uh, I, I decided that I wanted to see what the the other side of the pond had to offer. Came to uh, the US in Boston uh, in 2020 to 2023, where I was a, a postdoctoral researcher at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, before I then decided I wanted to transition into the core facilities world, and now I am the light microscopy facility manager at Brandeis University. And I am Ellen Dobson. Um, so I am a biologist by training. So I did my undergraduate in molecular biology and bioinformatics here in Wisconsin. Uh, but then I went on to do my PhD at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, I actually ended up doing two postdocs uh, because I transitioned uh, using those postdocs. I transitioned into the world of microscopy. So this is a familiar world for me. Um, my second postdoc actually was with Kevin Elisiri. I was a part of the Image J and Fiji team. Uh, so some of you might know me from that from uh, not so long ago. And then I worked as a staff scientist with Kevin again, as part of the Image J and Fiji team. But then I transitioned into the world of career development. This is really my um, passion. <laughs> um, and so I've been working as a career development manager now for the last three years. So I'm really excited to share some of my new training and insights with you all here today. So we're going to start with the job search process. So this kind of is the workflow, like the workflow that you go through um, when starting the job search process. So uh, you kind of start with self-assessment. What do I want to do? What are the skills and experiences that I have uh, what are my personal and professional goals? How would I want to apply them? And trying to align those things. Uh, so trying to figure out really where you want to go. And then the explore, exploration piece is searching for job titles, companies, organizations, and I trying to identify that target um, for your job search. Then you actually, once you have that target, you carry out the job search. You market yourself, you build resumes, cover letters, uh, start applying for jobs. Hopefully that lands you in the interview world where you then continue to market yourself um, and show your professionalism, highlighting your skills, both technical and soft skills. And then that hopefully leads to an offer, right, uh, where you then negotiate and are confident in the value that you're bringing to that position. And then hopefully you start your career off, right? So that's kind of the whole process. But throughout all this process uh, is sprinkled networking. So that's, you know, being able to ask questions of professionals out there um, is really important and having conversations with them through all of these steps, right? It'll inform each one of these steps and uh, help you through them uh, and hopefully make more informed decisions for your own career path. Um, of course, this process is it's it's a slow and steady one, but this isn't quite like the fable. Uh, in this case, the turtle doesn't necessarily win, the rabbit is what is going to get you there that much faster. So being able to network can get you through this job search process much more effectively, much more efficiently. And um, Andy's going to kind of walk you through what his process was and his experience in this. Uh, and today, of course, we're going to cover networking and resume, which are just two pieces of this overall process. Yeah, so uh, I, I thought I would contextualize this because it's it's a great example of the workflow. And when I was looking at what Ellen had made, I realized this is exactly what I went through just over a year ago. So 
I was a postdoc at Children's Hospital. Uh, I was doing a lot of work. I was uh, related to microscopy. I was training uh, a lot of members in my lab and discussing uh, microscopy with people a lot. And I began to realize that I didn't want to be a postdoc anymore. I didn't want to be a bench scientist. So I started thinking about exactly what I wanted. And I loved training people. I loved working with microscopes. And it kind of got me thinking about this idea of uh, being in a core facility. Um, so I started talking to my network. Uh, I knew a lot of the core facility managers in the area. I had core facility manager friends in the UK. And I started discussing with them about their job, what they like about it, what they didn't. Uh, and it really just uh, reinvigorated the idea that it really was the career path that I wanted to go to. So then I started going and looking for those jobs. Uh, and I looked on all these websites, Bioimaging North America, Microscopy DB, and began to find these core facility jobs that were becoming available. I started to apply. Um, I was very lucky in that my network was able to make some introductions for me, uh, which then enabled me to get to interviews. I interviewed at the, the Center for Imaging Technology and Education. Um, and had a fantastic interview there, loved the whole process. And it really, again, uh, reinvigorated this idea that I really wanted to be a core facility manager. I also interviewed at Brandeis University. Um, and again, my network was able to introduce me to the people at Brandeis. And uh, thankfully, uh, for the last year, I have worked as the core facility manager at Brandeis University. And as it says there, my network absolutely helped me at every single step along the way. And it was just perfect that they were able to help me in that way. So we're going to start with networking today. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat, but Andy's going to get us started. Yeah. So uh, Ellen and I wanted to, to ask you all, and hopefully you can just put something in the chat, but share a word or phrase that really comes to mind when someone says networking. What does that kind of word make you feel? Um, probably means a lot of things to a lot of different people, but we're, we're curious what people what people first think when they hear uh networking so if you could put that in the chat that would be great <laughs> nice mike yeah. crawl into a hole and hide does anybody else have any ideas or thoughts of when they when someone mentions networking how does it make you feel or what do you think of Connections, overwhelmed, anxious, extroverting, <laughs> stress, lost, socializing, connection. Okay. It seems like there's, you know, a good mix there of kind of the the positive and the 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 negative side of what people would associate with with networking, which I think is probably pretty typical. Yeah. Awkward. Yeah. That's yeah. Definitely, it can be. Um, but yeah, as, as Ellen points out here, um, I think a lot of it is the connotations with the word itself, networking. But if you reframe it in this context of really just asking for directions, as this nice little gif shows us, uh, I think it, it begins to make you think differently about networking and approach it differently as well. Yeah, so that's what we're going to talk, like focus on today. So the importance of a network, right? So networking can have, like we all seem to think, a bad connotation. Oh, right, Andy, this is you. No, 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 but no. it boils down yeah, to relationships no. and conversations. True. Sorry, Andy. Yeah, it does. No, so <laughs> exactly. Uh, networking can have that bad connotation. So we send some of those there. But it really is just, you know, building relationships, conversations. Um, mm -hmm. And importantly, as I have experienced firsthand, people absolutely trust people. It's one thing to see your resume, but also on top of that, personal recommendations can go an extremely long way, especially during hiring. They can help you get through some of those first kind of gatekeeping steps because, as mentioned, people do tend to trust the opinions of other, other people. Um, and also having a diverse network helps you to solve so many problems, both in terms of employment, but also in your scientific life. I, I can't think of the number of times I was able to just message someone within my network when I had a scientific problem and say, have you ever experienced this? And within a day or two, they had got back to me with, yes, of course, this is how you get around it. And, you know, it helps in every aspect. And some of the people who were, you know, uh, they began as colleagues and we were networking, meeting at conferences. These are people who now I keep in contact with, they're friends for life. Um, 
probably going to come to my wedding, at least some of the people who I met in this way. So it's, it's you know, plenty of advantages and important reasons to have a network. Right. So where do you even begin? So let's kind of, again, it's about the reframe. So these are just setting up conversations. They're just conversations. And in the world of career development, these things are called informational interviews. So what is an informational interview? Again, it's just a conversation. It's a short, informal conversation. It's a way for you to do research and gather information and, of course, build contacts in a new field, institution, a company that you might be interested in. You know, it's not a job interview, so you don't have to be nervous in that way. And it's obviously, and it also isn't really a chance for you to ask for a job. That's not what this is about. It's about gathering information without expectations. So why do I need to even do this? Well, it allows you to make an informed decision for the future. So you can sample a field or position an institution, a company before you just dive in and apply for jobs. It helps you avoid future misery and helps you clarify your own career goals and values. Does this job, does the job this person does, like, is that something I even want to do? Do I want to work for that company based on what they told me, right? It also allows you to expand your professional network. And as you can see, like from what Andy said, that's really key moving through this whole job search process. It also allows you to build confidence in your job interview skills, You're just, which are also just conversations at the end of the day. So it's about just putting on that professional hat and going out and having conversations with people and learning, right? Um, and you also gain access to the most up-to-date career information, right? You're talking to people who are in the fields, in the jobs that you're interested in. Um, so you're getting up-to-date info. So how do I even start? Well, you can start by just making a list of different fields, jobs, companies, departments, institutions that you're interested in, um, and then start reflecting on your own network. Do I have someone in my network that's connected to any of these? Uh, is there someone in my network that knows somebody that's connected? Um, are there gaps in my network? Are there places where I just, I don't seem to have a connection and how can I fill that gap? Um, using LinkedIn. LinkedIn is an amazing resource uh, for connecting in the professional world. So definitely use utilize LinkedIn. I'll so also say your, LinkedIn. Oh, uh, LinkedIn is great. It seems to be where a lot of the people from X, Twitter, Twitter as we call it, have moved. I will say I got two jobs through Twitter, uh, basically. Just engagement with my network, things that I wouldn't have seen if it wasn't for the fact that I had colleagues who were connected to other people and so even just by being connected to more people you just see more stuff as ellen pointed out but linkedin does seem to be the the place to be now oh yeah professionally it's it is the place to be to connect with people for sure um so let's start with assessing your network so look at the people you know you know connect with friends families social acquaintances um look at your colleagues you know people close to your work co-workers, collaborators, do they have connections? Um, so then there's, so those are all the people that you know directly who you can ask uh, to, to have these conversations with, or um, they know other people, right? So the people you know of, but don't know yet, can they connect you to those people? And then of course, there's the magical people who you don't even know that you don't even know yet. And those are the ones we want to really get to, um, because then your network starts growing and expanding beyond what you would, could currently, like, could imagine. So uh, in, in computing, I think sometimes there's this concept of this super node, and it's this amount of connections that individual people have to everybody else. Um, and, you know, you may be at the end of one of these things where you're connected to one person, but that person may be connected to two people and three people. And this is this concept that the networks really snowball. And the more people you get to know and the more you practice with this, the, the easier and better it becomes. But also... If you can find one of these people, this Kevin Bacon, for those of you who've heard <laughs> of the, the Kevin Bacon number, everyone can find themselves six degrees separated from Kevin Bacon. If you find someone who's so widely connected like that and they become, you know, a valued friend and colleague, those people are exceptionally important. And, you know, their their contacts will inevitably become your contacts. And, and that's like the benefit of finding one of those kind of super node connectors. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. And if you don't know a super node yourself, I'm sure you know someone who knows a super node, right? So that's great. Yeah. So, okay. This is Andy. This is still yeah. you. So, uh, yeah, re reaching out to new connections can definitely feel scary and intimidating. Um, but I, I think this is something that I have appreciated now that, you know, in the position I'm in, in that I'm in, I've had people contact me now. I'm hopefully paying it back. 
And the thing is, it, what uh, Ellen actually has written here is completely true. Curiosity is endearing. I love when people come with with curiosity and we start conversations. And if they show enthusiasm for, you know, their interest in what I'm doing, or hopefully if I show enthusiasm back, it is infectious. And it really just helps to get those conversations started. So, so be genuinely enthusiastic about it. Um, and uh, tr trust the process. A, maybe, you know, it's not going to go great right at the very start. But it's one of these things where if you stay focused, practice does make perfect. The more you have these conversations, absolutely the better you get at it. Every single thing you practice in your day-to-day -day life, the more you do it, the better you will get. Um, and something that I learned from a colleague of mine was not to let these opportunities just occur by chance. If you are going to a conference and you know that there is someone going there as well, they're giving a presentation, a post or a talk, and you want to talk to that person to learn from them, to learn about them, to learn about what they do, email them ahead of time and schedule a time. Make sure you hold yourself accountable to have these conversations. And just by having it scheduled, you'll find that you will have, you know, already shown curiosity, enthusiasm, and then everything else will snowball as a consequence of that. So this is something that I really took on board from a colleague of mine, and it, and it works. 90% of the time, people said, yeah, I have time at lunch. Let's meet up, grab a coffee and have a chat. And it's a, a, a great lesson to learn. Yeah, people are always happy to talk about what they do, right? And to give advice to other people who are trying to still maybe figure it out. Um, so that's great advice, Andy. Um, so when you're having these conversations, when you set up your informational interview, what should I ask? How should I even get started? Well, the best way to get started is to just get them talking, especially if you're a bit of an introvert or you're nervous. Um, ask them questions uh, about their own career path. How did they become interested in this field? Um, things like that, just putting the ball in their court and letting them kind of start. And that kind of helps you uh, kind of relax a little bit more. Um, the second group of questions should be about focused on learning more about the job itself or the company. You know. What are your, the current projects you're working on? What is it like to work for your company or your institution? What do you like most about your work? What do you like least about your work? That gives you information about, well, does this sound like something I want to be doing for a living, right? What does a typical day or week look like for you? You know, that, that really gives you information that you might not get just from a job ad. Um, uh, so to figure out, is this a good fit for me moving forward? And then finally, the most important thing is that you don't want that conversation to just end, right? It needs to go somewhere next. So asking them um, if they're a related field or position that they would recommend you look into, but most importantly, asking them for suggestions of connections. Are there other people you think I should talk to based on the conversation we had today? And then your network starts to grow without you having to do a lot of research and work and cold calls because you're going to start getting introduced to new people and you'll learn about whole you'll learn your network will grow you'll learn you'll meet new people you'll learn about things you wouldn't have necessarily known before um so then after the informational interview after you have that conversation I always take time to make more in-depth notes so what did I learn from this conversations what were some of my main takeaways how does what I learned fit with my own interests, abilities, goals, values? Um, and just because you have a conversation with someone doesn't mean you have to necessarily nurture and stay connected. Like sometimes you meet people and you're like, okay, well, that didn't really go well, or that's not something I'm interested in. Or sometimes you meet with someone and you really connect. Um, like Andy said, he's, he's made lifelong friends doing this, right? And in that case, you really, in, no matter what, whether it's a good or bad conversation, you send a thank you email the following day, thanking them for their time, um, acknowledging them for that. And if you really had a nice connection, be sure to follow up in a few months uh, just to give them an update of where you are in the process. Or if you they gave you a referral, oh, I contacted that person. Thank you so much. I set up a meeting and it went really well. And then make sure you follow up and contact those referrals. You mentioned your mutual connection um, uh, through that original contact, right? And that that's a great way to, or you can have them introduce you, um, which is even easier, but make sure you follow through and connect to those referrals. So let's make a plan. When it comes to networking, this is how you can get started. One, create a list of different fields, jobs, companies, department, institutions that you're interested in. The second piece, assess your network. Identify people who can help give you directions towards your career goal. 
The third is start making connections, set up those informational interviews, those conversations. You can do that via email. You can connect with people on LinkedIn, phone, in person. It's so easy now for to do Zoom calls, jump on a Zoom call. Um, that I guess that's a silver lining of COVID is that people are much more apt to do that, which is a great, it's great for networking and for connecting with folks. Like Andy said, connect with people at conferences, workshops, alumni events, professional groups, anything that you're a part of, part of Bina, right? Start connecting with some of these other people that are here. Connect with me and Andy on LinkedIn. Look for us, connect with us, say we saw your talk. Uh, we both have extensive networks in the imaging field. Um, so please use us too. And then nurture your network. Make sure you're following up, staying connected with those folks. And Andy's just gonna finish us off. Yeah, uh, I love this Alan Iverson thing. It's he talks so much about practice, and uh, this is something again. I I love talking to people, but I was exceptionally shy when I started my PhD. I think compared to probably some people, and it really was one of those things of I I just gained confidence going forward, and it really was those people who I spoke to gave me confidence in my own ability to hold conversations about my science, hold conversations about my imaging, and then. I was just so interested in what they were doing and there was that mutual interest back that it really was just easy to practice. And, you know, as Ella mentioned, some of those conversations, they may not go so well, but there will always be those ones that you think, wow, I really enjoyed that. And that's the best way to practice is find what really worked and then try and uh, expand upon everything that worked during those, those successful informational interviews. Um, so yeah, practice. We're, we're just always talking about practice. Like every skill, networking <laughs> takes practice. And then we just gave you a resource dump. So this is basically all of the resources that we've used to generate these slides, other wonderful resources that you can use to do deeper dives into this topic of networking. Um, we just tried to give you a whole host of things because this is just what Andy and I are presenting today for both of these topics, for networking and resumes. It's just a quick overview. And then we're presenting you with a bunch of tools and resources to so you can go on and do a little bit of a deeper dive yourselves. But before we move on to the next topic, are there any questions um, regarding networking or informational interviews that you guys might have? You could feel free to raise your hand or put them in the chat. While we're maybe waiting, as as Ella mentioned, if anyone here, feel free to feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. Uh, and you know, if you you want to learn specifically about my career path, Ellen's career path, I'm sure we're we're more than happy to talk about that. And as as mentioned, we we know a fair few people. Hopefully, uh, if we have one of these informational interviews, we can get the ball rolling for you as well. Oh, for sure. I definitely know a lot of uh, super nodes in my in this world. So. Um, oh, we do have a question here. Have you ever had negative networking experiences? Uh, yeah, actually, I will say that um, one thing that I found interesting at certain conferences, and Ellen and I talked about putting this in, but we we, we didn't, was this idea of uh, 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 like the scale of networking in terms of uh, the, the risk factor of going for someone extremely, extremely senior. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes there is a, a, a real benefit to approaching someone who is many career levels above you but uh also sometimes those people are so busy that it, it may seem like your your request is uh uh i, I it, i'm trying to find the right words to put it in alan but um it, there, there are clearly you know networking with fellow phd students postdocs if you're kind of at the, that level or you know a level below as a grad student an undergraduate that feels less you know uh intimidating but I think it, it necessarily wasn't a negative networking experience. It was more just my own intimidation at talking to someone who was so exceptionally successful and famous that potentially I, I maybe put myself off uh, while while uh, speaking to them. But uh, not a negative experience, but just something that I was aware of in my own way in which I, I spoke to people who were extremely senior. I mean, I haven't really had negative experiences, um, especially setting up because we're talking we're not talking about like getting in a room you know at a networking event and like walking around to strangers this we're talking about setting up conversations right at like uh with forethought right um but the negative one i would say just maybe not positive but in informative like i remember when i was doing informational interviews when i moved back here and i decided okay i'm not leaving madison wisconsin i want to stay here 
but what are some of the other types of things that I could look around? And I remember having informational interviews where as soon as the person was describing their job, I, I had thought I was really interested in doing that work. And then I realized as soon as they started describing it on a day-to-day -day basis, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't want to do this. You know, this is not the direction I want to go. But that's a huge benefit, right? So that was a person that I ended up not following up with. I, of course, thank them for having that meeting with me. But I didn't really follow up with them thereafter because I was like, nope, I'm pivoting to a different direction, right? And that's fine. Uh, another question we have, uh, do you have any advice that is, oh, wait. How often, how often would you follow up with people you have networked with? That really depends on your relationship. Um, some of these, it's just like any relationship, any friendship, you have different levels of friendship. You have casual friends, you have really um, people who you would con consider your best friends and how often or how much you connect with them. It's really the similar thing. Um, I think for me, I, uh, with specific people, if I met them at a conference, I would probably message them and say, hey, I'm going to this conference next. Are you going to be there? Would you like to, to reconnect? Uh, and I think there are kind of these organic moments where you, yep. if, you're, if you think about that person and the conversation you've had, that's probably a, a good sign to contact them and say, hey, how are things going? Um, and, you know, uh, some of these networking conversations that started out where we had a lot of emails back and forth eventually ended up with me being mentored by one of these people. And then our uh, meetings were far more regular. So uh, I, I think, again, it's probably looking for an organic time that kind of makes sense to 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 contact them. And as I mentioned, it, it could vary from person to person. Yeah, there's no per set like prescribed schedule or anything, um, but definitely following up with them somewhat regularly to maintain the friendship, right? To retain that, to retain that, um, professional relationship is important. So making sure they just don't completely drop off your radar, like Andy said. Um, then we have another question. Do you have any advice that is specific to microscopy and or image analysis? Uh, so two things. One, join your local societies, join your global societies, your, your national societies like BINA. I have met so many awesome people by being a member of the Early Career Networking Group. It has been a fantastic experience. Talk to, you know, you're going to these communities, you're going to conferences, like you will meet the same people like make sure as i mentioned schedule it try and specifically in the microscopy field you know there's photonics there's uh things like ascb where there's a lot of microscopy heavy kind of research done uh, but also the thing that i i think i have really benefited from is don't just think about particularly when we are in academia we we have this kind of bubble of academics um i love talking to our vendors and our reps and our engineers mm -hmm. uh they have an immense amount of knowledge that I think sometimes kind of gets overlooked. But, you know, their entire job often is based around literal networking with, with different institutions, different people. And I have been introduced to other core facility managers by our local vendors. And so in the microscopy field, if you have that ability to talk to the vendors, if you're not vendor facing, if you're not in a core facility, but you're a postdoc or a PhD student, talk to your core facility managers. They are those super nodes. They're going to connect you to the vendors. They're going to connect you to other people. Be interested in what they do. Um, so that's that's my microscopy specific thing in in terms of that. Well, and the lucky thing is that the microscopy and image analysis field is full of really amazing, supportive, helpful people who are more than willing to have these conversations. So I feel like this field in particular is very open and ready and willing to strike up these conversations and connect with you. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too afraid to, to get, to get that ball rolling. Um, we have another question. Suppose you want to migrate your field of work from your first postdoctoral work. How viable is that? And how will you start to do it? I mean, I did, I, you know, I was trained as a microbiologist. I studied bacterial pathogens um, and I transitioned into the world of microscopy and then did a, you know, I moved into Kevin's group um, and the image J team doing computational computational image analysis, and that's all I did. Um, so your postdoc is a great way to go out and learn new skills. Um, yeah, Andy, well, do you have something you want to? Yeah, one of one of my network actually during my PhD uh, once told me that um, you have your model organism, you have your technical skills, and then you have your knowledge around your field, and you can change two of those, but not all three. And so he contextualized it in, in that topic. And, and I did exactly that. I moved from working in one type of bone marrow cell in rodents 
So I had my, you know, my area of knowledge. I had my model organism. Uh, I had my technical skills. And I actually just changed like the field essentially and then went to work in a different bone marrow cell. So a lot of those things were you know, connected and I could try and identify where my microscopy skills, which were great for looking at stromal cells in the bone marrow, would perfectly apply to looking at megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. And so I think it's trying to identify where you want to be and where you are and where the, the Venn diagram kind of overlaps and seeing which skills you can already take into. Uh, and, and people value your diverse experiences. What you've learned in your current field, there will be people in your new field that you want to be in who have never heard of what you're doing, but there will be something that you will be able to teach them or bring some skill or you will know something that will inevitably benefit them. So, you know, having diverse experiences, I think is, is awesome. And it's, it's a benefit. It's not a, it's not a bad thing. No. And I feel like it's becoming the natural progression for most people in, in science now, right. Is to make these types of transitions. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's move on to the next section. So we make sure we cover everything in time. So now we're going to be talking about resumes, um, which is just one piece of that whole job search process. So our resume. So I'm sure most of you were all, most of you are coming from an academic background. We know what a CV is, curriculum vitae, uh, but maybe resume is, seems like something not quite familiar. So I just wanted to kind of lay out um, the differences between the two. So what is a CV? Well, that's a full professional educational history. Your resume is really just a shorter summary of your experiences and highlighting your specific skills. The length of a CV, there is no limit. That thing can be as long <laughs> as you need it to be listing everything pretty much in your educational and professional history. Resumes are usually capped at one to two pages. So for more technical type of positions, scientific related positions, two pages is totally fine. Um, so a lot of people think, oh, a resume has to be one page. No, not anymore. Um, a CV is typically a document that's requested in the academic or government research position world uh, for, you know, for research, doing grant, applying for grants, fellowships, and a resume is pretty much everywhere else. <laughs> that's the document that they'll be requesting. So if you're, even if you're applying in academia, but maybe non-faculty type of positions or research positions, then you'll be also submitting a resume, but in industry, it's going to be a resume. In the CV, of course, for your publications, you list them all. You always want to get that list longer and longer as possible. In the resume, you don't even necessarily put your publications in there. It really depends on the job to which you're applying. Um, so maybe you just have a select few that are relevant to the job, or maybe you don't even include any. Um, it really depends. For your CV, do you modify that to fit the job? No. Your CV is your CV. That thing doesn't change. It's, a, it's just a document that like is a historical document of all of your accomplishments. And that doesn't change, right? You, you would submit that to any sort of academic position. But a resume, yes, that resume is, should never actually be the same exact document you submit from one job to another. It should always be unique for every single job ad that you, to which you're applying, which is what we're going to highlight today. Um. So for both of them, content versus style, of course, the CV is really content driven. They're both, the content is important for both, but of course, formatting in general makes it more readable, right? Um, and digestible for anybody, whether it's your CV or your resume. So, um, but those are kind of the major differences. So now we're just going to really focus on the resume part. Um, so there are five key sections that we're going to cover today. Um, and this is just kind of an overview. So you can kind of just see overview what it looks like, should look like. You have your name and contact information. There should be an objective or professional summary section, an experience section, skills section, and then education. And those are the five main ones that you pretty much always have on your resume, no matter what job you're applying to. And now there's some, some other sections you could add in, and that, but that really depends on the job and whether or not you have um, experiences or things that are really relevant to that specific job. So if there uh, is teaching or mentoring involved, then you could include that experience, leadership roles, cert certifi certifications or licensures, honors, awards, and so on. But again, you only include those if it's really relevant to the job. So we're going to focus on these five, the five key sections instead today. Um, In the contextualization of that, uh, that question we had earlier about how would you migrate from your field of work to, you know, somewhere else, I think if you start looking at these sections and seeing those skills that you've developed in your first postdoc, you'll identify exactly which ones are going to transfer just inherently to any sort of similar 
position, even if the field is different. And so like breaking it down into these sections, you really start to see that, yeah, a lot of the skills I have, even though it's not the exact same field, they will translate. So I, yeah. I, I just wanted to bring it back to that question. Really good. Good point, Andy. Okay, so we're going to start with some of the top errors to avoid. Um, so it's not good when your your resume is not targeted to the job or it does not use particular um, important keywords that are um, relevant to the job itself, not addressing the needs of the employer. You need to do that. Failure to translate into the language of employers. So for example, using uh, academic jargon, um, that's not really going to that's not really going to fly. You read job ads and you can see the language that they're using and you want to mirror that in your resume as well. Um, having lack of context or maybe on the other end, too much description. You want to make sure that you're being as concise and targeted as possible to the position, the company, the organization. What is the mission of this, this company? What are the goals for the this job? And then focus on that. Um, failing to emphasize your accomplishments or using strong action verbs. We're going to go over that in specifically and you know overlooking spelling you know having spelling errors poor formatting doing being inconsistent with your fonts your styles um things like that hard to find dates and then don't use acronyms <laughs> don't assume that the reader knows what those are right um and so too it's important to note that this is a study that was done um about what recruiters are actually seeing how long does a recruiter actually take um, on average, they take six seconds to look at a resume. You have six seconds to grab their attention, right? And this is an eye tracker showing how formatting alone can uh, really make a difference on whether or not the recruiter looks all the way through your resume. You can see the one on the left is very text forward, like it's pretty um, dense document and they, the eyes don't even make it all the way to the bottom. Whereas on the other one, you could see that they're using they're blocking off the different sections. They're they're using bullet points and um, bold text, but in a very conservative but concise manner. Um, and then you get the eyes that scan all the way through. And you can actually see that your eyes are also drawn to white space, which also helps keep things organized and makes them more readable. So, uh, oh, Andy. Yeah, added yeah. This. so I, I, I looked at this, Ellen showed me this thing and I, I uh, just immediately thought this looks like a, a microscopy lookup table. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> and it really is about having that that signal to noise ratio, right? That's like the I guess the the relation I can make to the microscopy world is is trying to make the important bits be your signal and then you know make it stand out and have the 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 reader's eyes drawn to those exact bits. So that was just something I noticed about that is just immediately thought of uh, an LUT. <laughs> yeah. So six seconds isn't that long. So how do you capture your audience, right? How well, you have to think about them, right? Knowing your audience. Resumes are persuasive documents. So you have to think about your audience and what their needs are. So before you even start building your resume, you need to answer these questions. Where am I applying? So in what sector? Is it nonprofit, government, private? What country? So what do I need to know before applying in this, in this field? What's accepted or not? And then you can use your network for that too. Like getting feedback on your resume is really, <laughs> that's you tap into your network and get feedback from people. Um, looking in or trying to answer what does this employer value? Uh, what do I want the employer to actually know about me? And how have I applied my skills and knowledge to solve problems that are relevant to this employer? These are the questions you should be thinking about. One thing on that, I, I always oh, yeah. check uh, whenever I've applied for jobs. Obviously, the job description will tell you a little bit about, you know, well, it'll tell you a lot about exactly what they're looking for. But where, where Ellen has written here, what uh, what does the employer value? Every company, if you're applying for companies, will have a little piece on their website that is, you know, their company values and their uh, or mission have, statement, yes, right? Their mission statement. Yeah. And I have always gone and I have taken those words. And, you know, you will find that often you do agree with exactly what they're saying because those statements are designed for people to agree with them. Uh, and you can essentially reiterate that back to them and say, yes, yep. I see on your website you have this mission statement. And I, uh, agree with that for the following reasons kind of thing or highlight it in your resume. Yep. Smart. Great advice again, Andy. Um, two, sometimes it's not a person that's initially reading your resume. Sometimes it's an applicant tracking system. So it's a computer <laughs> that's basically parsing resumes and looking for keywords to, to help the recruiters, to help the process um, by weeding out 
uh, you know, like poor matches, right? So there, it's really just looking for a certain match rate. But the problem with this is that up to 75% of resumes from qualified applicants never even make it to human hands, right? So just being aware that applicant tracking systems are being used and there's a way to kind of uh, make your resume more friendly to these ATS, um, to ATS. So how do you achieve a high match rate? You have to, for example, identify, identify the job title or required experience, add this to your resume heading, um, identify the required skills and mention them throughout your resume. And it, at the end of the day, it's all about identifying relevant keywords because that's what it's pulling out from. So it uses the job ad, what are the keywords that are in there? And then is it matching to your resume? Are you highlighting those as well? Do you have those skills? Uh, and then you'll you'll get a higher match rate. So how can you do, how can you make sure that your resume will be read and read correctly? Use simple, clear language. And this is just general good advice for resumes, period. But as particularly for ATS, you want to stick to traditional resume section headers. Don't come up with some clever, fancy name for your professional experience section. It's a experience or professional experience, right? Um, use a common, use it common, easy to read fonts. Make sure your margins are one inch on all sides. Avoid using unnecessary graphics, embellishments, special characters. ATS is not like that, and neither do recruiters. <laughs> Keep things really simple, right? Or symbols, just avoid that. Anything that you think, a lot of people think my resume has to stand out visually. You don't need tons of graphics and things like that. It really is all about the keywords, the contents, the structure and use of white space, and being clear and concise and readable. Do not use tables or columns to help you organize your resume. That can that can affect the parsing of the text. Uh, use a Word document, ideally, uh, when you're creating your resume. And then I link have a link here to ATS-friendly templates. And then you can also use this website, JobScan, to give your resume like a little pre-scan to see how ATS-friendly it is. So how do you find those keywords to be adding into your resume? Well, a good way to do that is using AI. AI is a fantastic tool that we have at our fingertips um, that'll help us uh, find and use the right words. So this is an example prompt. So generate the 20 most important keywords from across a certain job title, uh, job description. So it will search the internet, right, for that job title and give you back a list of keywords. So I did this for an application scientist in microscopy. Right. And so some of here are the 20 important keywords that have popped out for that. So obviously microscopy, confocal microscopy, fluorescence imaging, but it all high it also highlights um customer interactions, technical documentation, research collaborations, uh, troubleshooting. And these are all things, these are skills that you all probably have. Like these are things that you're doing and working on it, you know, by getting your PhDs or working in your postdocs. Um but this gives you an insight into what are those keywords that I should be putting in my resume if I'm applying for jobs as an application scientist, right? So let's start going through the sections of a resume. So we'll start with the name and contact information and then the objective and personal summary or professional summary. So name and contact is very clear. Uh, just include your full name. Your street uh, mailing address is optional, especially if you're interested in if you're interested in jobs uh, where you might have to relocate, you don't want to necessarily put, if you're not in that current city, you don't want to necessarily put that. Like if you're willing to relocate, that's fine. It's relevant, right? So don't even put it. But minimally, you need your full name, your email address, uh, and usually use a private email, like your Gmail, and a phone number. And then you can also include a link to your uh, LinkedIn profile or your GitHub, um, your GitHub page. Uh, ideally, you just don't include any sort of HIPAA, <laughs> HIPAA identifiers, so not your social security number, not your fo no photos, birth dates. You don't want anything that would give them a chance to, um, um, like, not hire you, right, or object to you. So uh, don't include any of that sort of personalized information. Professional professional summary. So what is a professional summary? Well. You probably haven't heard of this before, but they're pretty much included in all resumes. Uh, and it's really important. It's three to five sentence, like little paragraph that describes your work experience and your mission. And that allows the employer to quickly understand your most relevant skills and qualifications for the job. So you, again, you write for the job that you want, not the one you currently have. And you use the terminology and keywords that are specific for that field or that job post. 
So it's actually, I equate it to, it's like an abstract of a paper, right? You read the abstract and you have an idea of what that paper is about. And then you decide, okay, I'm going to keep reading, right? To find more details. So this should be an introduction of, to, this is who I am. This is the skills, the training that I have. And this is how I want to apply that, those skills moving forward. This professional summary should be modified for each job application. It should be targeted to the job to which you're applying. You should be including skills and experiences. And, and then again, your own mission, right? Your professional mission. Use action verbs. Again, you would have supporting evidence in more detail in your experience sections in your resume. Um, and ideally, like Andy said, you want to align your professional mission with that of the job or the company. So checking out their mission statement, their about page uh, for the company. So you can, again, use AI to help you generate one of these. So given this list of key skills, so the keywords that we found before um, and experiences, uh, please generate a three to five sentence professional summary that highlights my main skills, values, mission that align with job title position. Um, so highlighting you the skills that you want to be applying, your general experiences, you can get a professional summary. So Andy submitted his resume and he did not have one. So I created one for him using ChatGPT. So I just pulled out some of his main skills from his resume um, and that he, you know, he currently is a light microscopy facility manager. So let's say he's applying for jobs like that with that title. And this would be a good summary for him, right? A dedicated microscopy expert with extensive experience in immunofluorescent staining, confocal microscopy, super resolution and wide field microscopes. I excel in both technical proficiency and project management. My mission is to foster a collaborative environment where cut Cutting edge imaging techniques drive impactful research outcomes. With a strong background in teaching and communication, I am committed to mentoring scientists, and empowering them to maximize their use of advanced microscopy technologies to achieve their research goals. That gives you a way better idea of who Andy is, what skills he has, and how he wants to apply them. Like, how does what are his goals in his career and helping scientists, right? So. Uh, yeah, when, when Ellen did this for me, I realized like, yeah, I absolutely should use almost that exact thing. And uh, I, I think as well, it's it's iterative. If you don't exactly yes. like or you don't think it's highlighted the exact thing, you could also just write, hey, uh, actually, can you make the reference to communication more prominent in this? Uh, and it will rewrite it for you. And then it will focus on that. So if you don't think it's quite hitting exactly the right thing, you can just have it redo it nice and quickly. But I, I loved what it generated for me. And I'm actually just going to copy paste it into my CV. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, ideally, you don't ideally, you don't just copy and paste it like, well, you read it right to make sure that it's relevant to you, right? It is reflective of your own experience. Like Andy said, be iterative, keep on having conversations with ChatGPT to refine it more. Um, but obviously, don't just default copy and paste. Make sure you read through it. It feels relevant. It feels like it's your voice and then use that. But it's a great tool. Yeah. Um, okay. So moving on to the experience, skills, and education sections, because we want to make sure we get through all this in the last 10 minutes. So the experience sections, so those would include relevant work uh, research experiences that show growth and development of skills relevant to the job application. Um what you include in those bullet points, which we'll get to, should align with the needs of the company and organization. Everything in your experience section should be reverse chronological order. So the most recent to the most past. Um, you should include accomplishment statements here. So these are these bullet points that describe your experiences. There should be about three to four maximum per experience. And those will highlight your responsibilities. Again, you use keywords and action verbs there. And ideally, you want to quantify your achievements. And we're going to get into that with this car and park frame framework. So creating these accomplishment statements. So you want, again, use the language of professional workspace, avoiding academic jargon, and reflect the words, the language that you're reading in job ads. You want to begin each one with a strong action verb. And I've included resources that have literally pages listed of strong action verbs just to kind of get you started. So use, again, also use keywords from the position description. Quantify whenever possible um, it, if it can enhance the description. You want to, in this case, you want to also highlight your transferable and marketable skills. Um, ideally, what you're doing is demonstrating that you have the skills to help them solve problems in this position, that you can start and start working on it and help them accomplish their own mission. And these are write it, written as bullet points, so it's more readable, okay? So they're single statements. So using this CAR-PAR framework, so that's challenge or problem, actions, and results. 
Uh, not every bullet point has to fit this framework, but it's really a great framework to use for the majority of them. So your challenge or problem, what are the challenges have I encountered in my work? Actions, what actions did I take to overcome this issue? In this case, demonstrating the skills and industry knowledge that the employer really wants. Then the results, quantifiable results from those actions. What were they and how did they benefit my colleagues, my group, you know, my department, institution, and so on. So these are just a few examples. So for the realm of data analysis interpretation, you know, conducted three longitudinal research projects from design to completion in four and a half years. It doesn't tell you what the projects were about or what the nitty gritty was of the science. It doesn't matter, right? It shows initiative. It shows, you know, uh, management skills and that you can do that in a timely manner, right? Communication, manage and mentor two undergraduate researchers in senior research projects, presented research at two national conferences to share primary findings with fellow researchers and faculty members. So again, quantifying and then what are the goals and what are the outcomes? Collaboration and leadership, collaborated with two graduate research assistants and a postdoc to identify and assess ability of motel cells to determine path of least hydraulic resistance. Again, that is a little bit more digestible as far as like the academic jargon of what could be written on the details of that project. Um, but that's what you want to do, right? You want to make sure that anybody can read that and understand what it is. Lead three, led three undergraduate researchers to complete project goals on time and within budget for developing an effective treatment technology. So how do I, how do I even start creating these accomplishment statements? Let's start by using G chat GPT to kind of help us. So to identify some relevant achievements. So what are some example, you can ask AI, what are some example accomplishments that they could list on your resume? And I gave them a little bit more uh, detail. So for example, I have a PhD with this list of skills coming from academia, but let's say I want to move into industry in this, this role, right? So again, we're going to target the application scientist role in microscopy. And it gives us a list of what are some kind of some um, accomplishment statements you could add in your experiences. Um, and obviously the numbers and things, they're, they're just made up, but these are something you can use as a framework, right, for your accomplishment statements. Then what you want to do is match keywords to those achievements. So using the keyword search that we did before with ChatGPT, which of the following of those keywords would be a good fit for this achievement, right? So you're trying to match keywords to certain achievements that you're writing. Right, so listing those keywords that we searched before for that specific job title, and then picking out a few achievements and saying, okay, which keywords target that one? And then what you wanna do is combine them, right? Combine those keywords and achievements to make, start building your accomplishment statement. So you ask ChatGPT to, to please combine this achievement and these keywords to make a great resume bullet. So I have another example here. Um, so these were the keywords. So it, it basically integrated those keywords into that resume bullet. So you go to um, the end result was developed and validated a high throughput quality forming assay, leveraging advanced imaging systems and optical systems, which optimized protocols, reduced workload and time scale by whatever percentage and minimized plastic usage by whatever percentage through effic efficient data analysis. So it's plugging those keywords in and that's, that's the trick, okay? And then what we can do is rank and optimize our accomplishment statements for a specific role because you're, the job to which you're applying, they're putting the prioritized wish list of what qualifications they want. And you should also reflect that in your resume and highlight those in particular in your uh, using your accomplishment statements. So rating them. Um, I'm just going to move a little bit quickly so we can get through the rest of this. So skills section is simply list them, right? They should be, again, tailored for the job application. They should be prominent and just listed. You have technical skills. You have a whole host of different kinds of skills. Of course, you have technical skills, which were acquired through training. So, you know, doing microscopy, computer programming, image processing, qualitative, quantitative de data analysis, project management, technical writing, but you also have interpersonal skills. So those are behaviors or traits used to interact and communicate with others. So written and oral communication, time management, people management and mentorship, conflict resolution, collaboration, then you also have personal qualities. You know, how do you approach your work? Well, I'm a team player. I try to be inclusive, create an environment that is adaptable, self I'm self-disciplined. Those are personal qualities you can also highlight. But the two most important ones really that any hiring manager is looking for is your ability to communicate and your ability to collaborate. 
for the most part, they you will be applying for jobs where they know that you have the technical skills, but highlighting communication collaboration skills are really key to landing an interview. Education is very simple. You can just highlight your degree, department, institution, dates. They don't care about your thesis title unless it happens to be really relevant to the position. Um, you don't need to include your GPA or anything. Again, it's just reverse chronological order. All they care about, what degree did you get from what institution and what dates? And then I included a link here uh, full of a bunch of chatbots that you guys can link uh, or can use. Uh, one is for career exploration and gives you tips on your resume as well. I built a few chatbots for resume skills gaps. So looking for what skills skills might be missing from your resume that according to either like plugging in a job description or plugging in a job title, it'll help give you feedback too on how you can incorporate those into your resume. And then missing keywords. So making sure that you're highlighting the keywords for the for the job that to which you're applying. So use these tools. Um, hopefully that'll help get you guys building some really strong resumes. And then again, we have a bunch of resources here for you. And if you have any questions, uh, we're happy to stick around and take them. And we also have a feedback survey that we would love you guys to fill out. Vanessa has added the links uh, in the chat, uh, but we're happy to take any questions. Um, we're at time, but. That's it. Thank you so much, Ellen and Andy, for your presentation. Thank Round you, guys. Of applause.